Not guilty, not guilty, ten Charles times. Charles Manson, described today by the star the witness again. The so-called Night Stalker case reached its verdict today. Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime the of murder. The suspected of shooting Selena is still holding police at Music bay. Music producer Phil Spector was convicted In Monday. In Los Angeles, a killer the police are calling the Hillside Strangler. Do you find that Mr. Depp has proven all the elements of defamation? Answer, yes. Hello and welcome back to LA Legal and we'll be talking about the Night Stalker today. So notice how they put Night Stalker in like giant letters. A uh, little fun fact, um, I've been calling him the Night Walker. So if I say that, just please don't, just keep rolling and put a little like text bubble at the bottom. Yeah, it is a Night Stalker, Richard yeah. Ramirez of course. Yeah. And it's interesting because he actually named himself. He went through a few different names, you know, before he settled down on the Night Stalker ultimately with, with um, I think one of his last victims, but I think because Ramirez wanted to be called the Night Stalker and as one of the most deadly serial killers in Southern California history, we should respect the name and we'll, we'll stick to Night Stalker. Well, he was also a student. I mean, he followed the Hillside Strangler, you know, so he really put some effort and thought into this person that, that he was. So anyway, I'm just saying that because I may say the Night Walker, just everyone know that we're talking about the Night Stalker, okay? Um, so let's get started. Are you ready? Ready. Let's do this. So Ricardo Richard Leva Munoz Ramirez was born in 1960 in El Paso, Texas, and was the youngest of five children. His father was an alcoholic and physically abusive. At the age of five, Richard suffered from head injuries and epileptic seizures from the abuse. Richard began spending a lot of time with his older cousin, Miguel, who was a military veteran. Miguel spent his time serving in the Vietnam, committing horrific acts of rape, murder, and torture of Vietnamese women. He even showed photos of these acts to Richard and taught Richard how to kill without getting caught. So I want to stop here for a second because this is, the reason we're talking about this is because it's kind of giving us an, a look into who this person was and, and why, right? He, he committed some of his acts. So I want to know, in your time, during your time prosecuting, did you find that some of these acts, right, so these people who commit these horrific, horrific murders, do they usually have a similar past where they come from abuse and alcohol? And, and talk to us about that. Absolutely, unquestionably, Liana, the answer is yes. And we're dealing with a case right now. And depending on when you see this, the worst school shooter in American history, Nicholas Cruz. I mean, we're talking about the death penalty here, right? And he's someone whose mother drank, smoked crack cocaine, used every drug imaginable while he was pregnant. She was a prostitute, didn't want him. Um, what Ramirez suffered, I think, was far worse. But there's clearly something that happens to people that cause them to end up serial killers or mass shooters. Um, and the, really the question is, were they born bad? Or did they become bad at some point? Um, and obviously, what happened to Ramirez, I mean, the abuse that he suffered at the hand of his father, let's talk about it. I mean, he would beat him so much that he would lose consciousness. He would have seizures. He would run away and sleep in a graveyard. This is a young child. Did you uh, see that he ha he would tie him to a cross in a cemetery and leave him there overnight as punishment? I mean, I mean that is... If that in itself is not horrific, I don't know what is. In a cemetery, I mean, I get chills just thinking about it as a child being tied to a cross. And I'm wondering if that kind of where the satanic obsession comes from. Well, clearly, I mean, even up till the very end, we're going to talk about the trial, of course. Here's someone who's obsessed with Satan, made his victims, you know, pledge their allegiance to Satan. And this is someone that probably grew up thinking... Now, regardless of whether you're religious or not, that there must be no God as a young child to kind of suffer this horrible abuse that he did. Again, I have no sort of sorrow or I don't feel bad for people like Nicholas Cruz or Richard Ramirez. But for us to sort of understand how people end up like this, we really got to sort of start at the beginning. And for some serial killers, it starts in the womb. And it seems like for Richard Ramirez, it started at a young age. Yeah. I agree. I, I don't know if people are born bad. I'm really a believer in, in the fact that kids are born and they're like a blank slate, right? You hate is taught, you know, evil is taught, you know, and I think that this is a prime example. If your own parent is doing that to you, right? I mean, we have kids, your children rely on you for for comfort and safety. And, and if a parent can turn around and do this to their own children, I mean, you're teaching them that 
there is no such thing as comfort and safety and, and, and all of that. So it's horrific. Yeah, and you're normalizing, right, rape, murder. I mean, these are the types of things he's exposed to as a child, as a teenager. He's seeing it. He's seeing the mm-hmm. pictures. I mean, he's seeing his cousin yeah. kill his own wife in front of him. I'm sure we're going to talk about yeah. that as well. Well, Imagine. let's get into that. Yeah, let's do it. So he sees his cousin, as you mentioned, uh, kill his own wife. Um, you know, he at this point, he's taking LSD. He becomes, uh, this is where he becomes interested in Satanism. Um, so, so what are your thoughts on that? Right. I mean, this to me, it's like I would probably lose it if I saw somebody murder someone else, someone I know. I mean, it's your cousin's wife at this point, you know, just just talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, I think, again, I'm not a psychologist, but I've seen enough of these cases and done trial commentary on enough of these to know that you start to become detached. Right. You I guess this is a bad analogy, but, you know, when I was a prosecutor, the first time I put someone in prison, like it really hurt. Like I felt bad. For the defendant, I felt bad for his family or her family. But over time, you just become a little bit more desensitized. Doctors, kind of when they lose their first patient sometimes in the ICU um, or in the OR, I mean, it's so difficult. You remember your first. But then when you're exposed to violence, and whether it's physical or sexual, you know, and you're seeing it in front of your eyes and someone that you respect and you look up to is not you just become detached from it ultimately i think that's that's sort of the beginning of what went wrong for richard ramirez and of course obviously the drug use you know we talked about lsd but really i mean his cocaine addiction um we joke around and say it's a hell of a drug but really was the motivation and the impetus for a lot of these burglaries and robberies and so uh in the early 80s when he moved to california he started using cocaine as you just mentioned and so he started committing burglaries and and petty thefts to pay for that addiction so now we're kind of seeing um a a little bit of a pattern here a little bit of an uh, motive right for for all of these crimes but again they're such petty crimes right i mean he didn't when he was uh, eventually uh uh caught there really wasn't a big history, right? It wasn't like he was off murdering people before. It was just burglaries here and there. So what I'm interested in is that jump from, okay, I'm just robbing like a liquor store for some money to pay for cocaine to now I'm actively targeting women, children, men, and killing them. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the interesting things about Ramirez is, I mean, the sexual assaults. It could have been a young woman. It could have been children. I mean, there was really sort of no rhyme or reason or pattern. I don't know how he chose his victims, but ultimately at some point, and maybe, the, I mean, obviously the first known sexual assault was when he was working for that Holiday Inn. Um, he tries to assault a guest. Um, and then interestingly, the victims didn't come testify. Had they testified against them? So for those of you who don't know, he's working at Holiday Inn and he is... You know, he has the master key, so he's stealing from guests. He would watch them undress, and at some point he starts to rape them, or at least try to rape them. Well, in one instance, there's a husband and wife. Husband catches him trying to sexually assault his wife, basically beats him up. Police come, he's arrested, but ultimately the husband and wife, they're not from Texas. They go back home to wherever they're from. So they don't come testify against Ramirez in that first rape case. I wonder had they done so, things would have ended up really differently. But would they, I mean, wh- let's talk a little bit about what happens, right? So let's say he gets convicted of that rape or assault. He goes to prison for, what, a short amount of time, perhaps. Uh, he comes out. He has to probably register as a sex offender, right? Um, but what happens, right? Our viewers may want to know. If you're a sex offender, is there, like, are they keeping tabs on you? And well, yeah, I mean, you're supposed to register. Um, they're supposed to know exactly where you are. I'm mean, Obviously, this is before the Internet, but now you can go online. You go um depending on your state, obviously every state has a Megan's Law or it's equivalent to have a website. So um, if you haven't done so, it's pretty terrifying. Search your address. You'll see how many sex offenders live near you. You know what's scary? I've actually done that. Yeah. And growing up, I lived, you know, in a very nice neighborhood. You know, it's... And when I looked up all the little, like, stars around, I was like, what the heck? Yeah, so, I live right next to a school, so, like, I'm good. But, um, but yeah, you know. It's, yeah, it's, it's yeah, scary. You'd be surprised. You'd yeah. be surprised. Follow his instructions yeah. at your own risk. So, uh, in 1984, um, Ramirez moves to San Francisco. He goes between SF and Los Angeles. He continues to terrorize the citizens in both cities um, with a series of brutal murders for about a year. So, now we have those two cities terrorized for, oh, about, I think, a year and a half. Um, and so victims are coming up. So I'm a little older. Um, okay. Don't want don't to date myself, but I think this predates Liana. But yeah. <laughs> I was alive when Richard Ramirez, and I was a young kid, and people were scared 
expletive. I don't want to get uh, banned on YouTube. But I mean, literally, I remember being five, six years old and people were talking about the Night Stalker. Terrified. I mean, you know, when you kind of grow up in this, because again, it was so random. There was no rhyme or reason. And he was just hit consecutively week after week, day after day, month after month for such a period of time. At least during my lifetime, there's never been a serial killer yeah. like the Night Stalker. Right. And so when I was reading on this, when this got pitched, right, and you have victims in, um, you know, like Monrovia and West Covina. And I'm like, gee, I know these places. I cannot imagine. I would probably lock myself at home and never leave. Oh, 100%. So yeah. if this is going on for, for over a year, I could just imagine. And, and um, I think this is what I'm just jumping ahead a little bit caused such a circus when he was eventually uh, caught. But, um, so let's get into the LAPD task force, right? So now they have absolutely no leads. The man leaves no trace behind, absolutely none, right? Um, there are a few eyewitness, uh, you know, descriptions of him. So they know kind of what they're looking for, but there's really no, like, fingerprints for them to to. Yeah, it's really match. a shoe print, right? right? I mean, that's really kind of all they got, the very unique shoe, a certain size. I'm mean, Obviously, we're talking about many, many years ago. This is certainly before DNA, um, you're relying on old school techniques, right? Footprints, fingerprints, witness identification. Now you got like cell site evidence and internet search history yeah. and DNA and like, Surveillance, I mean, but... law enforcement has many more tools at his disposal um, than they but did But you back know then. what I thought was interesting is that he, he, so one of the victims, six years old, he abducts her from her, from her bedroom. He takes her to his home, rapes her. And then he just, he lets the kids go which I thought was, you know, there's a few survivors who eventually came and testified, and she was actually one of the little girls who came in and um, identified him in a lineup, which I thought was interesting, right? As some of some of his victims were able to get away. Um, yeah, that was very powerful. If you guys haven't watched the Netflix documentary yeah. on the same, um, it's really a must-watch, very good, in the last episode. I don't want to give it away, but the victim describes how she is identifying him in a lineup, and six-year-old, you know, at the time, and... She's saying, you know, do I have to write it down or do I have to say it verbally? I mean, it's really incredible. Like, I almost started crying. I just started thinking of my own kids. You've suffered something so horrific. And again, compare and contrast to very different. But you have a husband and wife that don't want to come to court to testify. And maybe things would have been different. But you have this young girl who's been sexually assaulted. And she goes and she identifies Richard Ramirez in a lot. And she tells the detectives, I want to participate yeah. so that he doesn't hurt any other little yeah. girls like me I mean it's just it's powerful and a little aside this is actually one of the main reasons why I wanted to steer clear out of uh, the DA's office when I was interning there in law school is my first day on the job I went to trial and they put on a little girl who had to testify about what this delusional disgusting human being had done to her and I sat there like this is something until this day I'll never I will never forget that day and yeah. I I went home and I thought Wow, this is just not for me because it, you you carry it differently. When it's yeah, I know. I hate those types of cases. I've done a child pornography, um, sex trafficking, production of child pornography, which is the worst because you're filming someone getting sexually assaulted, and then you put it out on the internet. I mean, so that person is re-victimized again and again. It is the worst of the worst. I hated those cases. You know, and again, my wife represents victims of sex abuse, so God bless her. But it's just incredibly hard to handle those cases. So I get it. I hated it and tried to avoid it when I could. Right. It's it's very emotional. So I want to talk a little bit about the chase because I thought this was really yes. fascinating. Right. So um, LAPD finally finds uh, a lead. Um, you know, they go back and forth. So LA and SFPD, they go back and forth about whether do we announce yes. who we have or do we not. So, so let's talk about the announcement. Right. So, OK, the first big lead. Right is that footprint. So it's interesting, and it all kind of comes full circle in that then mayor, now Senator, Dianne Feinstein, she holds a press conference and she says, hey, we have a lead. It's this shoe print. It's this footprint, right, or whatever. And of course, what does Ramirez do? And LAPD and sheriffs are pissed because they've given up one of their good leads. So Ramirez throws those shoes uh, off the Golden Gate Bridge. So now they've lost their lead, um, one of the key ways of identifying. But let's talk about what finally um, really identified Richard Ramirez as the Night Stalker, and it's that thumbprint, right? Right, yeah, in so the back of a, a rearview mirror. So they get this thumbprint. Uh, I think it was in Orange County that they get it, and then they contact San Francisco, and now we have a decision that both police departments have to make. 
do we announce that we have finally, based on this fingerprint, found our guy? And um, and I thought that was really interesting because I thought, well, why not, right? People are terrified. We know who it is. But now they're afraid because he's a flight risk. I mean, he's clearly following the news. He's he's watching. So what what are your thoughts on that? Do you did they act appropriately? I mean, they eventually caught him. But, but yeah, no, it, it's it's interesting. Like right now, right? You know, you, you identify a person. It's very hard to have no digital footprint, right? You know, everyone's got a cell phone, internet activity, credit card. I mean, this was. I mean, people don't realize this is talking about the '80s, right? If you had a credit card, you'd have to like swipe it and recall a phone number, you know. So, um, even if you know where someone, who someone is, it's much harder to find out where they are. So, I think ultimately it turned out to be the right decision um, to notify the public. One because there was such a hysteria, but really they helped apprehend him. I'm sure it was, we're talk it was about yeah, it was the community. So he gets on the bus trying to flee uh, Los Angeles, right? And somebody identifies him because now his photo is everywhere. It's in the newspaper, and everyone's talking. So about he it. he happened to have left Los Angeles, right, to visit oh, his brother yeah, in Arizona. Yes, yes. So he's he was coming back, back mm -hmm. but it's it's really fascinating. It's one of those movies. He literally sees his picture on La Opinion, which is like a newspaper that's still around, a big a Spanish language newspaper. So he comes back, he gets off, he sees his face, his picture on the newspaper right yeah and uh and so someone identifies him gets off the bus and starts dialing and yeah. he sees this so he's like uh oh yeah um so he tries to flee right and um another vehicle i think it was it was like a city employee somebody in a city car i think right starts following him so now at this point it's like a full-blown chase you've got helicopters this is very like oj-esque yeah. to me you know so now the entire community is back to mass hysteria they know who it is he's in the community he's and then he gets off the bus and starts to flee on foot yeah he like runs across the freeway tries to carjack yeah. someone yeah. i mean and he gets into a neighborhood where he goes into someone's home try to steal their car uh he hits the woman not knowing that her husband's home so yeah. he comes out they engage in this altercation. i mean it's it's chaos yeah, is this a weapon? Was it like a tire iron? It was or tire, something? yeah. Yeah, and the guy like beats him yeah. up, and then all of a sudden this mob is yeah, the neighbors. Him. Yeah. I mean, it, it was incredible. It was just incredible to to hear what they have to say, and the fact that these people, right, these people in this community, came together to apprehend him until the police arrived. Yeah, it was amazing. I, I'm surprised they didn't kill him. You know. And you know what else I thought was interesting? When the police finally arrived and they handcuffed him and, and later in interviews, he said, yeah, they all these people think they're so brave. Had I had a gun, they wouldn't have been so brave. Because yeah, I'm surprised he didn't have a gun because, I mean, yeah. he's a night stalker. Yeah, so. <laughs> maybe he does that yeah. at night. Very yeah. Batman-esque. Yeah. But anyway, he gets apprehended. He, um, you know, they drive him to the police department and he shows very little remorse from that Zero. point until the very end. Till the end, right? I mean, let's talk about the trial, right? They have thousands of jurors. Everyone's heard about this case. People are terrified of them. Um, ultimately, they get, I think, 12 jurors, 12 alternates, and they start this case. But, like, I mean, I don't know, it was day one or one of the early days. He flashes the yeah. sort of the pentagram, the the satanic yeah. symbol. Uh, and he's just, like, laughing. Of course, he's and... got a groupies in court, oh, right? Oh, my God. He, he's got groupies, but he also ultimately got married in prison. I'm sorry. I'm not gonna, I, mean, I, gonna, I know you don't speak for all women, but like what what's going on here from like this? Is this like they love bad boys and Richard Ramirez is the ultimate bad boy? Like what are people thinking? I here? think that people are thinking he's a celebrity because everyone knows him and it doesn't matter like what kind of celebrity. But just the fact that this person took so many lives and brutally abused so many people and children and to think that these women came to court to support him is honestly for me it's sickening i, I don't understand it and me to me that's like a whole like mental health issue oh, right yeah. there I on mean, its own yeah someone that like obviously does this is sick in the head but like for you to fall in love with mm -hmm. someone like this mm -hmm. they wrote letters to him and so i actually saw an interview of the woman he married i don't know her name and i don't care to know but she said i'm so proud of him and i was like proud of what exactly like what are you proud of because you could have very well have been one of his victims right because oh, there was course. absolutely no sort of pattern here and he i think was thriving off of that right it, it was like it, it was fascinating to see footage from from the trial yeah no question so now the trial's happening right i mean we know that he's going to be found guilty right i mean there's no question but a couple of interesting things happen uh, the first is that apparently he threatens to kill the prosecutor 
And the reason we now have metal detectors in court are none other than the Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez. That's the no reason. No way. Yeah. Wow. Uh, little known fact. So um, for good or bad, that was one of the Night Stalker's contributions to our criminal justice system. So so we got, yeah, so we got metal detectors in court now um, because of the Night Stalker. And of course, very sad, but very interesting as well. One of the jurors is murdered during trial. Well, luckily it wasn't him. Yeah, but a lot of people thought it was. Like, he's in prison, he's calling shots, and he's able to kill one of the jurors, right? Like, it's the mob. Um, ultimately, sadly, that juror was killed by her boyfriend. And we know it's much more likely, statistically, for murders, for the murderer to be someone you know. I mean, obviously, the Night Stalker is terrifying right, when something like this happens. But Well, that's interesting because, I, I mean, for me at least, um, I am admittedly a, a true crime junkie. I, most people know this. Um, but people like this scare the heck out of me, right? And so even in movies, I'm watching this documentary on Netflix. It was actually very, very creepy for me because I was like, damn, this is like this literally happened right here. And so I'm far less scared of like, like zombie and like ghost movies because I always think like the likelihood of me being murdered by Satan is far less likely than some crazy murder. You know? Well, it's interesting. Again, we're talking about other cases, right? So right now there was a woman in Memphis who was jogging, um, Eliza Fletcher, um, big case. She was murdered while she was jogging. And, you know, they've done surveys of women and this is a fascinating question. So I got to bring it up and they asked women, Hey, if there were no men for just one day, what would you do? And the number one answer is usually I'd go for a walk or a jog at night. So even though the statistics may not show it, this is a real fear that women have. And obviously the Night Star had male and female victims. But um, I believe that that fear is real, um, even though, again, it's probably much more likely that someone you know is going to harm you. Than well, let me ask you this. With... Um the mental health crisis, what it is in this country, right? It's increasingly yeah. becoming far worse. Do you think those statis statistics are going to start shifting a little bit? Because it, I think we're starting to see a little bit of a shift of like just random crimes. I think you're going to see a lot less serial killers. There hasn't been one in a long time because right now, a couple things have happened. One, the technology has changed such that law enforcement has a lot more tools at its disposal. You're not going to be able to kill just multiple people over a series of months or days. What we're seeing, sadly, is a shift towards mass shooters because you have weapons that can kill a lot of people in a short period of time. So um, I think serial killers, even though there's a fascination with them historically, you know, for the true crime junkies out there, I think they're going to be fewer and far between. But you sadly are seeing a lot more mass shooters. When was the last big serial killer? It might have been the Night Stalker. Probably. Yeah, there mean, hasn't our been producer one. Noah would know. Yeah. He's any no? You don't know? I think this is it. The most recent serial killer. This may be the most recent serial killer. I don't think there's yeah, been one. Yeah, because this was like in this was 85, 85 right? 85, so. yeah. Yeah, around the Golden State Killer time that he did his last killing. Yeah. Yeah. So this is it. So wow. we're talking about the eighties as a child of the eighties. You know, we're talking about forty years now almost. So Well, I mean, you're right. Mass shooters, school shooters are now the new serial killers. And we and I think that there's gonna be an era when people are gonna be talking about these kept happening all the time every few years or so. Hopefully we eradicate mass shooters like I think law enforcement has with serial killers. Absolutely. Um ultimately again, as expected, Richard Ramirez so much evidence and we can't possibly defend himself. I mean, we're lawyers, we like to talk about the legal side of the case. This was headed towards a guilty verdict. But, of course, he's found guilty. He's sentenced to death, of course, in the gas chamber. Um, I want you to talk a little bit about that because yeah. I think a lot of people are interested, and as was I, obviously, before I kind of met you. Yeah. But how do prosecutors determine what they're going for once a case gets on their desk? Yeah, so in California, right now there's a moratorium on the death penalty, so it's not happening, but... Back in the 80s, the death penalty was very real in California, and it still is an option in many states in the United States and, of course, our federal criminal justice system. So when you're a prosecutor, you're looking for aggravating factors. What makes this much worse than, and I hate to use this word, but like a typical murder, right? Is there any mitigation? Is there any moral or legal, like, I don't want to say justification, but a reason why this happened? Or was this someone that was just trying to inflict pain? I mean, we don't have time to go through every one of Ramirez's murder, but like he would like cut the victim's eyes out. I mean, just terrible, gruesome stuff. So if you believe in the death penalty, 
the Night Stalker is a death penalty case. There's no question in my mind. Right. So who? Do, so is it the prosecutor assigned to the case that determines it, or do you need Usually to? Usually like, the head yeah, of the office. So, the office. Um, you know, it will be. So it's interesting on the federal side, the attorney general or someone that the attorney general delegates his authority to. It's one of the top two or three people in the office, I believe. I have to double check. Um, it's not the local U.S. attorney. It's like basically the head, like Merrick Garland right now. Interestingly, stateside, it's the local district attorney that makes a decision, not the state attorney general. So it's up to the DA. Um, and the DA of L.A. County at that time, I forgot who it was, obviously, um, made the decision and Regardless of how you feel, that that was the right decision. That was the right decision. Yeah. So what I also found fascinating is that his defense counsel had only been in practice for like <laughs> two years, right? Yeah. So really maybe defended like burglaries, petty yeah. theft, nothing with the death penalty. Yeah. So what were your thoughts on, on that? Because yeah. they became celebrities too. Oh, they did, yeah. So, you know, in a case like Richard Ramirez, and look, I do court TV and law and crime, and oftentimes there's, again, haven't handled a death penalty case in California because the death penalty hasn't been around in for many, many, many years. But I am always on with attorneys in other states and, you know, they're at the top of their game and a lot of them have had death penalty cases and it's interesting. Oftentimes in a death penalty case, just saving your client's life is a victory. You're never going to get a not guilty verdict for someone like Nicholas Cruz, but if you can save his life, that's a win. So that's really what the focus is for many of these death penalty practitioners. And then also, because you have those mandatory state and federal appeals, you're trying to necessarily look at that next level because oftentimes, yeah, you're, you're never going to get the jury not to return a death sentence, but maybe you can get an appellate judge or court to do so. Well, that's probably what happened here, right? I mean, we have this trial. He gets convicted, and then he goes through the appeals process. Yeah. So his counsel, uh, defense counsel tried to appeal the process, obviously failed. It's a 50,000-page trial record. Yeah. That's a very complicated case, tons of evidence. Um and so I like what it says here. As the verdict was read, Ramirez smiled. Okay. If this is not the most on brand sort of thing for him to do, right? Show oh, I'm sure he enjoyed it. Close right? to no. I mean, it was a circus for many reasons, but one of them was because he was just living and thriving off of that energy, which I thought was very chilling. Yeah, it was. He's probably one of the, at least again, because I grew up with it, one of the most terrifying figures in American history, I would say. And have you. You've seen photos of him, right? Yeah. Of I mean, I've when you videos, look at you, you look at him, and it there's nothing behind his eyes. It's it's. Scary. Oh, he's dead inside. Like yeah. you know, we like since we joke around, like he is dead. He has no soul. Yeah, so. none at all. He's terrifying. If I had seen him on the street, I'd probably be very very terrified. Um, and so okay, any uh, final thoughts? Let's talk about you know he ultimately uh, spent his life in prison. He um died of complications from B-cell lymphoma at yeah. the age of 53 recently, so about yeah. 55 some odd years. Um, what are your final thoughts on him? Yeah, um, really just one of the most depraved human beings. I'm, I'm, I'm even hesitant to call him that. Um, and the effect that he had on Southern California during that sort of rampage, that month, uh, the months, the year plus that he was terrorizing folks in um, San Francisco and Southern California, I, I don't think I'll ever forget. And most people who are of that age will never forget. And But at the same time, I think he may close the chapter um, in serial killers. And, and obviously he, you know, had this affinity for the Hillside Strangler and other serial killers. I mean, we're, we're talking about Bundy and Dahmer and all these other folks that we have and will continue to cover on the podcast, but I believe that he really does close the chapter on serial killers in U.S. history. Yeah, that yeah, I agree with everything you said. And you know what just came to mind is when we talk about him being the student, right? He's he's followed all these other serial serial killers. What we're seeing now is a lot of these school shooters, oh, right? They're copycats. They, yeah, they're yeah, copycats, and it's almost like it goes back to that question of are we glorifying these people? And they are such, you know tormented souls that they're seeking that sort of of course no celebrity question. level yeah i mean dates back to columbine right and again we're talking about the most recent one nicholas cruz just because it's happening right now but he shot videos of himself on social media and youtube and he said he will be the next school shooter and i mean these are things obviously he had his own mental health issues and the guy was like effed in the head no question um but yeah they're seeking this kind of fame this notoriety um, so 
And again, I never would never, ever, ever blame the victims, but as, as the public, are we doing something? Yeah. Well, on that note, thank you, Nima. This was actually really, really interesting. Noah, thank you for introducing me to the Nightwalker slash Stalker. You know, I will never forget. Um, and thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next time.